we want to talk to you about a subject that I'm very passionate about, which is the independent agency sector. I think it's in rude health. I think it's a great time to be an independent. And the subject uh, that we're discussing today are what are independent agencies doing differently. It's a great time to be an independent commercially because of the seismic changes going through our industry uh, that perhaps are disproportionately affecting the holding companies. It's a great time to be an independent I would say kind of spiritually, because we all like challenger brands. We all like the David in the David versus Goliath battle. And I think it's a great time to be an independent, because in many ways we look to the independent sector, and particularly startups, um, to sort of see what's next, uh, to see where the industry might be going. Um, with that in mind, uh, we've invited a few people to speak to you today. And the kind of questions that I want to be asking them are, what are you doing that's different? What are you doing that we can learn from? What are you doing that's making money? Uh, where are your innovation plays? And perhaps if we have the time to needle a little bit, uh, is all that glitters gold? Are we drinking our own Kool-Aid? It's very easy to be an independent agency and celebrate independence, uh, but really where are, independence, where are independent agencies really cutting it? Uh, and what can we learn from them? So with that in mind, uh, and without further ceremony, I'm going to invite the four panellists to join me on the stage. Please give them a round of applause. I'll get in the middle. Hello, Paul. Hi, Mark. I was looking at the top. Oh, I can see that. So look, you've all got the biographies in front of you, so I, I won't read them all out, but I'm very excited by the four people that have joined me on stage. I'll tell you briefly why. Uh, starting from the end, uh, and a gentleman that I've never met before, but I spoke uh, uh, on the phone to the other day, and that's Will. Uh, Will is the uh, cultural strategist, one of the founders of the Elephant Room, and they have a really interesting take on culture uh, and a strong point of view uh, that I'll come back to in a second. The gentleman on my left is Paul Hammersley, and Paul uh, has been there and done it uh, and got the T-shirt in terms of running network agencies in this country and in the U.S., uh, as well as starting a very successful independent agency that's still going uh, and, uh, and founding the Harbour Collective, a new proposition that sets itself up very much in opposition to the holding companies. Uh, we have uh, Katie uh, on my right. Katie is uh, one of the principals and the strategy partner uh, at Mother, and she has been at Mother for 10 years, uh, and Mother is in many ways uh, a great poster child for the independent creative sector for all sorts of reasons that we'll explore. Uh, and at the end of the row, uh, the end of the row, uh, Jenny. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the row on which I'm sitting is the wonderful uh, Jenny, who is the founder of um, uh, Seven Stars, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, one of the greatest success stories uh, in the uh, independent media sector and winner of many uh, of, the, uh, of the awards uh, in that space. And Jenny's got a very strong point of view. Uh, on what, uh, what makes, uh, what explains Seven Stars success. So in order to just to uh, allow them to limber up a little bit, uh, I'm just going to ask them to unpack something of their proposition, uh, starting uh, at the beginning of the row with Jenny. Um, uh, Jenny, in, in many ways, when, when one uh, starts up an agency, one starts it up partly as a kind of a response to the experience that we've had uh, in perhaps in network agencies. Uh, what, what, was the, what was the question for which Seven Stars is the answer? Um, I think that, that's a really good question because when we um, set up, I think it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to literally start with a blank piece of paper and think about uh, what type of agency you want to create. And um, from our perspective, it was really about... Um, we, had, you know, we had three things in mind. One was um, what kind of an employer we wanted to be. Uh, so I completely resonate with the conversations earlier about, you know, this is a battle for talent. Um, and if you can in some way be a better employer um, than your competitors, that's the, the key to success. Um, we wanted to work with clients in a uh, very transparent business model. I know we can talk later about business models. Um, and we wanted to create a, a different and distinct brand in the market. Um, but, you know, we genuinely spent more time thinking about what kind of culture we wanted to create and what kind of employer we wanted to be um, than about anything else and to, about our business when we set up. Thank you. Um, Katie, I know that there are three principles, three powerful principles at Mother that animates everything that you do. Can you share them with everyone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I like to think Mother's probably a 21-year-old startup. 
um, still fiercely independent, and we don't have very many rules, but we do have the Holy Trinity, those three principles. And no qualms about it, it puts the work front and centre. So the first of those is to do the best work we possibly can. The second is to have fun, which doesn't just mean great parties, like the football party we're going to throw tonight. It also means a very open and direct um, relationship with each other and with our clients. And third, always in this order, is make a living, not a killing. So for us, profit is the happy byproduct of making the work of our lives and building a really great culture. And that's been the same for 21 years. And as the partners of London, it's the thing that we defend most fiercely. Thank you. Paul, we talked about principles as well. We talked about the principles that network agencies were originally founded on and the principles that the Harbour Collective is uh, founded on. Um, what, what, what problem are you seeking to, to fix uh, with the Harbour Collective? Uh, well, the biggest problem is, that, is a realisation that 75% of our business is controlled by six companies, which doesn't make any sense in a business which is primarily about human capital and creativity. Scale is not the answer to most of our problems. That's, that's the core to it. Um, but I suppose what we set out to do is to help clients access and manage all the talent, the entrepreneurial talent, genuinely entrepreneurial talent that exists in independent specialist businesses, and to help those independent businesses kind of level the playing field a bit, if you like, with the holding companies through uh, creating alliances and partnerships to deliver better solutions to clients, to pitch better, to find new routes to market, etc. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're about. Brilliant. I'm going to be quizzing you on that in a minute. <laughs> you already have. Um, I'll, be quizzing, I'll be quizzing you some more. Okay. Um, Will, I, 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 um, I highlighted before, I hinted mm. uh, at the very distinct view you have on culture uh, and how it affects your agency proposition. Can you explain that to everyone? Yeah, so I guess the Elephant Room is um, it's just over a year old. Um, and I guess as a group of founders, it was very much kind of um, sort of founded on the idea that from all of our experiences, we know that diversity and inclusion is a huge sort of conversation both in the industry and outside of it. Um, but how do we create an agency environment that is actually kind of keeping brands on the right side of culture? I think there is um, a kind of uh, an assumption, and maybe rightly so, that advertising has sort of fallen behind when it comes to culture. Um, I think what we're witnessing is people, um, whether that's creatives or kind of audiences that sit outside of the industry, sort of rapidly steaming ahead in terms of kind of creating culture. Um, and it kind of feels a lot of the time, if you look at agency teams, but you also look at the output itself, um, a lot of it feels like it's falling flat on a point of view of culture. Um, so off the back of that, that was kind of very much the sort of the driving motivator um, as a team of founders around creating an agency that kind of very much uh, stays in touch with what's going on, but also knows how to work with talent, um, but it's pushing the culture forward in that way. Okay, so th thank you. Hopefully, hopefully that's uh, useful to you just in terms of context setting. What I really want to dig into now is the notion of people first. What does that really mean? And do independent agencies really do that better? I want to dig a little bit into how independent agencies make money, uh, and then hopefully uh, we have time to squeeze in a question about innovation in product and service and some lessons for, from, for us all. So um, we'll, um, we'll, go, we'll go back round in reverse order just to shake it up a little bit. Um, um, I, uh, you have some very challenging views on what network agencies or maybe established businesses, let's say, to make it less mm. oppositional, are doing profoundly wrong, uh, that the elephant room would like to do profoundly right. Um, tell us what that is and, and why you think that will make a difference. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm coming at this from the point of view of talent and having worked with a lot of young creative talent that sort of looks at an industry and doesn't see itself reflected, um, but also doesn't see kind of access, access to the industry as well. And in our experience, that kind of means that you're missing out on a lot of amazing creative talent that is already out there kind of outside of the industry doing the most incredible work. Um, how do we prize open the industry that, to allow that kind of energy, that creativity, that innovation to sort of come in and reinvigorate what is essentially kind of um, uh, sort of a, a work stream, I think, that kind of feels quite flat a lot of the time. Um, so, I don't know, one of the things that we were sort of talking about before on the phone is this idea of legacy, and I think a lot of people sort of question what that even means anymore. It feels very possessive, it feels kind of very stuck in the past, and a lot of what we're thinking about is, is the future. Who really cares about legacy outside of um, the advertising industry? I'm not convinced that sort of anybody sort of does from an audience point of view. Um, so what are the questions that we're sort of asking ourselves to, to, to that point, I think, is, is very much what's driving us. I'm thinking. So make it nice and tangible for us. We were walking into the, uh, 
uh, the august offices of the Elephant Room, what would we see that perhaps some people in the audience wouldn't recognise in their own offices? Yeah, I think it's more about what you'd hear. Um, I think like there's a sort of um, we could talk about what you'd see, but I think the kinds of conversations that are taking place, the kinds of people that are involved in those conversations at all levels, um, is probably unlike kind of what uh, a lot of a lot of people would sort of find that they'd walk themselves into. Um, from my point of view, like I work in research, that's my background, primary research and sort of trends. Um, and I was working at agencies where um, the sort of the lack of understanding and empathy when it came to culture, you know, I was sort of sat there asking myself. Um, how can I be having these conversations with friends and in creative circles outside of work, but actually when I'm at work in my nine to five, um, a lot of these conversations are sort of falling, falling flat on a point of culture. Um, so you kind of have to ask yourself sort of, yeah, how again you sort of open that up. And I think with us at the Elephant Room, um, we're working with a lot of young creatives, we're working directly with audiences as part of that creative process. Um, my kind of role, I suppose, is to sort of bridge the gap between insight, audience, um, and creativity. So working very closely with our creative director to make sure that she's part of that research process. Um, and off the back of that, kind of sparking um, the springboard for better creative. So if I'm understanding this correctly, this is about how you do what you do. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And okay. also the people that, that you're getting to, to deliver that work as well. I do think it's, um, it's a mindset point of view. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Paul, um, you've become a bit of a champion um, uh, of independent agencies, and obviously the Harbour Collective being a collective of them. Yeah. Uh, it's entirely, uh, entirely appropriate for its leader to champion the independent sector. Uh, what are your agencies or the independent sector, how do you think it's handling the question of people and culture differently to, uh, to holding companies of, of your? Well, I... I guess, well, one of the things we have tried to do at Harvard is to learn from the holding companies, because there's lots of great things about the holding companies. And I had a period of time working for Omnicom a few years back. Uh, at the time, I don't think it's true anymore, they had a management uh, system, really, which is called People, Product, Profit. It's not unique to Omnicom, um, but it was a driving force behind the way they did things. <laughs> and the simple logic is you, you hire the right people, you, chat, you look after them, you develop them, train them, motivate them, etc. <laughs> um, that will produce the right product, whatever that kind of product is, in whatever sector you're in. And as a consequence of that, to Katie's point, the byproduct, if you like, of that would be reasonable profit, profitable growth. Um, and Omnicom, at the time, ran its businesses like that. You had management meetings, you had, you had people meetings first, two weeks later you had a product meeting, then you had a profit meeting. I have to say, in the two years I was there, that did actually reverse, which signaled a change, I guess, of, of approach. <laughs> now, and I think, I think independent agencies intuitively run their businesses like that. They don't all codify it like that. Uh, they probably couldn't necessarily express it like that, but they, they understand, and, and Will just made the point about culture, and Casey talked about the people thing, so they understand that that's where it starts. People's where it starts, and the mm -hmm. consequence of that will be everything else, and at the end there is some money that should reward whoever it is, the owners, the founders, the staff, whatever. And, and that, to me, is the strength. And, and I, whereas I'm afraid to say the holding companies increasingly are starting at the other end of that conversation. I worked for an unnamed holding company for a while, not on the come. Uh, and the CEO once said to me when I was running an agency in New York, you give me 20%, you can have what you want, you can do what you want with the rest. Which was very cute and very wrong as a way of, in my opinion, running a business. How extraordinarily generous as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to keep the rest yourself. How yeah. motivating. I don't think you meant it quite like that. Um, so, um, Katie, if we can, let's talk a bit about motivation. Uh, and how does it feel, uh, or how do you want it to feel, uh, to be an employee at Mother? Um, uh, and why do you think that's good for business? I, mean, I think not just because of the name, Mother feels like a family. So people either absolutely love it and stay, a decade is, is a short tenure really at Mother, um, or tend to leave quite quickly because it's not what they want. But our, our staff turnover is 40% lower than the industry average. And I think that's because it doesn't really feel like work. We have a phenomenal office. We have great fun together. We have reinstated an annual ski trip where we take the whole agency away for a long weekend, which is like being a teacher taking school kids, 150 <laughs> school kids away. Um, and everything that we do is designed to bring out the best of people. We don't have a hierarchy. Um, we don't have account management as an intermediary to our client relationships. Everybody's client facing. And we have a nurturing but challenging environment. So I, I hope that people at Mother feel that they have permission and the space and opportunity to make the work of their lives with people they really admire and people they trust 
and are inspired by. And as I said before, then, then you, do make, you do make money, but you don't have everybody operating from a position of fear. We have a heck of a lot more choice and freedom to chart our own destiny, and our people come first, and as does the work. So there's a massive point there about culture that you could probably dedicate an entire conference to, um, yeah. about the kind of the culture of permission versus fear, how to liberate people, how to make them feel like uh, that they can do the best work of their lives. Um, uh, Jenny, I, I want to just nuance that question slightly for you. Because it's clear that when you have a very small organisation, in a sense it's more agile, you can do more with it than a very large organisation. Um, uh, Seven Stars started as a very small organisation and now it's got bigger. Uh, how have you managed to preserve some of this kind of people first culture at an organisation as it's got bigger? Um, so I think it's definitely harder as you get bigger and that would be, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that, you know, when it was 50 or 60 or 70 people it felt like one gang together. Mm. Um, but equally, you know, this is where, again, ind independent agencies actually have it much, much easier than the, than the um, network agencies because when you have no external shareholders, you can literally make those decisions and, you know, how much of your profit you want to reinvest into the team or whatever it might be, or the ski trip or the trips, office, yeah. etc. But they're your decisions and they're tough decisions sometimes because you've got to slightly keep a bit of a business brain on but equally, they're so much easier when it's your own decision, it's your own business, and it's your own P and L that you're looking after. So, um, I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, there's thousands of things that that we will do to try and retain this feeling that we are, you know, creating a you know community where people can have great careers as well as creating a business. Um, and it's something that we, you know, we we measure. Um, less through you know things like churn, but more through things like engagement rate, employee engagement rate, through things like you know being in the Sunday Times best companies to work for, things like that are really really important to our business. Um, and we, they're the things that you know we always say if we were if the business was going great, we were winning clients, we were making great profit, etc. But the people when you when you walked into the agency didn't feel right. There wasn't the buzz and energy that there is, um, that we would not be getting any satisfaction from it and it's not the business that we set out to create. So it's, it's, it's almost emerged organically as you can tell, we each had a conversation over the last week or two just to, to sort of sound out our, our views on this topic by way of preparation that there was a very clear kind of people first, culture first ethos emerging from the businesses on this stage. But this is a commercial conference, hence the question about, well, you know, does it help us make more money? Does it lead to uh, reduced churn? Does it lead to better engagement? Does it lead to better insights uh, and better work? I I'd like to uh, turn, if I may, to the question of, of, of making money, of the filthy lucre, and the notion of, uh, of commerciality <laughs> in independent companies. Um, uh, and I'll stop going up and down the line and just uh, look at you all <laughs> and see who's inspired by this question. Uh, to talk to the question of... Um, of commercial models. So whether it be pricing, whether it be uh, brand extensions, new products, new services, uh, I'd love you all to just share a view uh, on, on what you're, how you're approaching the, the question of making money uh, in a way that, and feel free to, to offer as many secrets up to everyone as possible <laughs> so that they can write them down and replicate them. Um, uh, and not just have to go back to the boss and say, thank you for sending me on the course. Apparently, we need to do more skiing trips. <laughs> um, so, so um, Katie, can I just pick on you because you're smiling yeah, at me? of course. Go on, go for I, it. I wish there was a silver bullet. I wish I could say, this is how you make money and we could all um, go for coffee. But I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all solution. We have lots of different models. We don't um, in any way have disdain for being paid for our time, as long as you have a carefully managed scope. I'm very happy with performance-related pay, as long as we share the same definitions of success as our, as our clients. And then we're looking at other models, whether that's upstream through Broody, the product and brand um, accelerator that we have founded, or backing people who have started a PR agency as part of the mother family to diversify our revenue streams. But I don't think there's one size fits all, and I think that we are facing exactly the same pressures as the networks. The clients are bringing more in-house. The big tech companies are doing more of it themselves. It's scrappier, <laughs> but I guess one of the big things that I feel the independents do have an advantage <coughs> over is we can cut our cloth to what our client needs. Uh, we don't have fixed models. We can be much more flexible. 
And I think that flexibility is going to stand us all in good stead for the future because ultimately we don't have to deliver the 20% or more every quarter to our shareholders. We can decide to take a bit of a hit for the longer term benefit of an account and our people. Jenny, you're not nodding vigorously, yeah. and I know that uh, yeah. Seven Stars have an approach to how they make money. Um, we do. But, um, yeah, we've, we've that taken, we, we take quite an extreme uh, position on uh, the, commerciality, the commercial model for a media agency, so this is more relative to the media industry, but um, our position on, um, uh, well, we, we have what we call a um, single source of income, so we only earn money from clients, so we have a variety of different models of how clients pay us, predominantly it's a time-based model, um, but our point of principle is that we don't make any other money through the machine of media buying, so we don't mark up programmatic or ad tech or um, you know, take any kind of uh, commission from media owners or anything like that. We basically we're just about clients paying us for the work that we do. Um, and we also have, um, we've kind of built on the single P&L, so we've always had a single P&L, um, but what we do that I think is really distinct in the market is we actually have within that, we have a single revenue target. So where we're investing in programmatic teams, insight teams, data teams, analytics teams, all of those great people, uh, they come in with a sole objective of being brilliant at what they do. They don't come in with a pound sign above their head. Um, and, you know, the clients feedback to me that that, that, that whole model is completely different they don't feel they're being sold to. They don't feel they're immediate. They need to scrutinise the recommendations we make to work out what our commercial model is behind it because our commercial model is so simple um, and so easy for people to access. And increasingly, it does go back to the culture thing. So, um, you know, people who join us, in, particularly in those specialist roles or in strategic roles, find that very refreshing. So they're there to be brilliant at what they do. They're not there to sell, you know, products and services that clients don't necessarily want or need. Uh, um, I, when we spoke the other day, you were talking about there's no imperative to cross-sell uh, yeah, at Mother. that's why I was nodding. Yeah, so we, can you explain that to everyone? We don't set targets for our business directors or anyone in the team to, you have to get everybody. It's lovely if they do, but we don't mandate that different parts of the Mother offer have to be um, sold to our clients. In fact, our independence means we can play really nicely with whoever else is part of the interagency mix and collectively decide what success will look like for us, which is just so liberating. You know, it's, really, it's, it's a different world where you don't walk in thinking, I have to steal their lunch and I have to make them look rubbish. And it's, it means that you can actually look to make the best possible work for your client's problem, mm -hmm. rather than, as you said, having to, to cross-sell and divert your focus from what you're brilliant at to hitting that target. I don't know if you were nodding or not because I was looking over here, but presumably you've thought quite a lot about this because well, you've put together a proposition designed to yeah, I think, foster I mean, collaboration. I think, interestingly, pricing is the biggest, one of the biggest issues that we all face. Uh, I believe Tim Williams spoke at this conference mm, he did. last year. Um, if you haven't seen Tim Williams' presentation on agency pricing, you can find various versions of it on SlideShare or their Ignition Consulting website, but I, I don't have any... Or the uh, IPA website from last year? That, I think they're a fantastic, he's a fantastic uh, uh, consultant and presenter on the subject. And one of the biggest points he makes is that there's a massive disconnect between where clients see value and where, where agencies have costs, effectively. Uh, and big agencies, dare I say legacy agencies, are constantly, of course, they have to keep selling the costs that they have. And that disconnect between where the, agencies see, where the clients see value is one of the most difficult things for anyone running a big agency, a big holding company agency, to deal with. And to Casey's point, if you're running an independent agency, you have the flexibility, I think, to adapt to what the client need is and where the client sees value and identify that value and apply that value to the challenge. And I, I think uh, I, that's why I'm so grateful I'm doing what I'm doing as opposed to in my days of running a big agency where, where you really are trying to make sense of what you've got. And that's a really tough thing to do. And, uh, mm. Tim's presentation about Wavemaker was incredibly impressive mm. uh, because he's been dealing, actually, I guess, with merging two legacy mm. businesses. But it's not easy to do. I know I've been there, I'm, honestly, I wouldn't want to be there again. I think the speed of change and what clients want, what clients value requires flexibility and adaptability and all that sort of stuff. And pricing, how we price what we do is, you know, we, we can't keep going on just charging. It, as Tim Williams describes it, industrial era pricing. Because in 1780, when they first started selling wool out of a factory in Lancashire, 
They didn't know how to price it. So they said, well, what did it cost us? Oh, I know, that, X, and we'll add a bit to that. 250 years later, that's how most agencies are pricing what they do. So how are you doing it differently at Harbour? Or how would you like to be doing it differently? Well, every, every agency, I don't, I'm in the spirit of Harbour, I'm not telling agencies how to price what they do, but these are conversations we're having about how you can do that. Mm -hmm. well, one of the ways of doing it is to try to separate what we call design from delivery. So we create a, a design team around a client challenge or a new business opportunity which draws on skills from different agencies and that design process is limited in time and scope and is charged out on a flat rate. Nothing to do with how much time it takes. We, we have this notion that, again, Tim talks about called contextual pricing where you, a bit like how Starbucks price their coffee, big one, medium one, small one, 83% of people buy the one in the middle. doesn't matter how much, what the prices are, what the sizes are, that's what they do. They've tested it to death. So, you know, there's lots of agencies, around, particularly in the US, that have got you know, platinum, gold, silver pricing models, and guess what? They sell the one in the middle. Whatever the, but that's not the only way of doing it, but I just think trying to separate the kind of the grunt work, the delivery, which probably still does have to be, in many cases, charged out on a cost plus basis, but trying to develop a product, if you like, that brings together all the skills and services you need and sell that product as a service as opposed to selling it as a time based thing. Well, how do you charge? <laughs> if I was telling you. Um, it's, it's just interesting, like, hearing um, all of this, because I think, like, the way that we sort of approach the work that we do, we're talking about kind of commercial growth, and I think we see that as synonymous with cultural. Um, not to kind of bring it back to that, as I know we're sort of talking about it a lot, but I think a lot of what we're looking at is the future of work, and again, kind of interesting to hear the speakers that were on before, but looking at how kind of people want to work, how the world of work is changing, and then how we ourselves assemble teams according to a client's need, um, as you were saying, Katie. Um, so I think kind of being an independent, we have greater agility um, and flexibility to do that, but then also kind of thinking about emerging roles within agencies. We have a head of talent who, you know, it's not a recruiter and it's not HR. Um, she's embedded within our agency and she has access to a really wide pool um, of, of creative talent who we then kind of um, call on on a project by project basis, um, almost a little bit like the Avengers kind of assembling very quickly. Um, and through doing that and through working with freelancers on that basis, we're kind of avoiding building um, big overheads kind of, but still having that core team um, who's helping to, to steer the work as well. So different models of working, different models of pricing, not one size fits all. I'm going to ask the panel um, uh, for one tangible uh, expression of innovation, something that each of the agencies are, is doing or trying um, differently in the setup. I explained that in many ways we look to the independent sector and particularly startups for, for what's next in our industry. Um, so uh, that's the final question. And if we have time, I'll look down at this. If we have time, I'll open it up to questions. And if we don't, we'll just go and have coffee. Okay, so um, my final question, which is um, in the spirit of openness, uh, we have no secrets in this room. Um, can you share an initiative uh, on the commercial side of your business, uh, a new uh, entity, a new service, a new way of thinking um, that, uh, that you think is uh, noteworthy? Who wants to go um, first? I don't mind. Go for um, it. Yeah, so I guess w one thing that we're sort of um, building at the moment, or I guess it's more kind of a, a guiding philosophy, is the idea of being inclusive by design. Um, and that's kind of looking at the fundamental relationship between client, creative and audience. Um, and for my part, kind of looking after the audience side of things, um, what we're trying to do uh, as an agency is sort of build a robust um, and rigorous insight and research function in the heart of a creative agency. Um, I think quite often from a research and an audience insight point of view, there is that disconnect between creative um, and where the origins of that insight comes from, um, whether that's a siloed research agency that sort of hands over a debrief and, and sort of never sees it again. Um, so really trying to bridge that disconnect in an effort to kind of provide a more um, representative um, springboard for creativity, but also kind of I see my role as, as inspiring creatives to, to do the best work by representing the audience. Um, and I think that's just something that we need to kind of be thinking about uh, as, a, as an industry is kind of the role of insight and, and real research um, within the kind of functions of, a, of an ad agency. Um, so that's, that's sort of one thing that we're... Oh, to the resist the temptation to dig into that and, uh, uh, and ask how uh, you're approaching insight and whether it's different. Um, uh, but it's an, um, it's, I think it's a laudable aspiration. Paul? Well, I guess I've already talked about the, the, our, ma our major initiative, which is a separation of... A separation of uh, delivery and design. So that's probably, in terms of client-facing innovation, the only other thing is obviously one of the, one of the ideas behind Harbour is to help smaller businesses uh, benefit from scale. So we are 
looking at a whole lot of operational issues together. How do we buy insurance premiums as a group? And lots of, so fairly, well, it's a commercial audience, so maybe more interesting than it is for others. But but it, you know, independent agencies do suffer from. I can't remember the, the, all the latest data, but the margin, the, the amount of money that's spent below the people line mm. is far greater proportionally mm. than it mm. is for the holding company. Diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies of scale. We, we should, well, obviously that's rent, but it's, it's other places like, I mean, recruitment, actually, someone we touched on earlier, the cost of recruitment is, I think, in most people's case, the second highest cost after people. Mm. After rent and related, it's, it's recruitment. Um, there have to be new solutions to the recruitment <coughs> model, which is so old-fashioned, it makes our business look positively modern. Um, and just paying and recruit the same recruiters less money isn't, isn't the answer to that. Um. Thank you. Um, I, oh, without getting all Gareth Southgate on you, uh, I think uh, someone wrote the other day about that you can judge a leader by how many leaders they've created. Uh, and I think one of the things that impresses me most about Mother is how many businesses it's spawned. Um, some, of, uh, some of which you, you may never have known came from Mother in the first place. Um, what, what, what new businesses are you guys getting into? Um, I think the, so three years ago, Mother backed a PR startup called The Romans. And in three years, they're now profitable business and were voted PR agency of the year. And that was purely based on the people who were starting it. <coughs> and they didn't come with clients. Full disclosure, one of them is my husband. Um, <laughs> and I used to work with both of them. And they're, they're very good. Um, but I guess perhaps more applicable um, is the startup, startup that spun off from one of the founders and mother, Broody. Uh, and they work with brands and products who are in a startup phase to bring marketing expertise into their organization and help <coughs> them scale at pace, which in of itself is an interesting startup. But what makes it interesting for us is how we collaborate and partner. Um, we have equity in some of the businesses that Broody also have equity in. Um, it's a joint venture for us. We do sweat for equity in terms of creating collateral and providing the actual tangible marketing output for the Broody startup businesses. And given that we know the big traditional clients aren't necessarily where the growth is coming from, finding an avenue in to work with startups who might believe that they don't need to build a brand because it's all about performance marketing at that early stage of their business is something that is, something that is very interesting for us. Um, it's a very different way of working. It demands a lot of us to be more agile, to move faster, to take more people out of the process, which for an agency that prides itself on how agile we are is interesting. Um, but I, I guess that would be the one thing that I think is an interesting area to explore. How, to, how do you get in with those new kind of businesses so that we can chart a different kind of future for the industry rather than relying on businesses who are all facing even more disruption than we are um, and cutting their costs left right sector. Definitely fascinating. And what it means for us to remodel our businesses in order to serve them. Jenny, what are you guys up to that's, that's interesting in the innovation space? Yeah, same. We've, um, you know, throughout our, um, you know, pretty much since we set up, we've uh, invested in joint ventures. We've, um, you know, backed other uh, kind of startups. Um, in fact, two of our successful ones are here today. I didn't think we we're going to be here today, but um, we set up an agency called Bountiful Cow two years ago, and we've got a, a joint venture around um, content uh, called Alpha Century. We're both here today. Um, but I just the, the one thing I would say, and I think you know when again when it, when you're an independent agency, it's nice to be able to support other entrepreneurs in the industry, and it's nice to to work in a, that kind of collaborative way. Um, equally, you know we've had some pretty disastrous uh, attempts at doing things like that. But you know as long as you kind of go into it um, risk aware, as long as you go into it uh, that you want to learn something, as long as you go into it that not everything that you back is going to be a success. Um, and you're not afraid of that failure and you face into it, um, then I think it's, you know, it just adds to, you know, adds to the intellectual capital, if you like, of the agency. So I think it's really worth, good, it's a good question, it's a really worthwhile thing to think for us to keep challenging ourselves. Mm. Are, we, mm. you know, we, are we taking full advantage of you know, these businesses that we've created? Um, are we continuing to you know, support other people in the market? And are we you know, really doing something different and innovative, you know, ongoing? So risk, an intelligent approach to risk. Uh, and speaking of risk, I'm going to take the risk of asking one question and stopping you having your coffee. Is that okay? Or do we need to go to coffee? We're out of time. So I took the risk and it didn't work. <laughs> but I'm all right with that, if you are. Um, uh, I wanted to say a major thank you to, uh, to the panellists for sharing some of their insights and you for your patience and I hope you enjoy your coffee. <laughs> <laughs>